So please know this meeting is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube. If you just typed in ECAC building task group, um, it will come up as well the previous uh, recordings as well. And you may even get the other groups recordings also, which you are welcome to um, to watch if you if you would be interested in knowing what the other groups are doing as well. So thank you everyone for making the time to be with us today. We really greatly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start first with um, reminding everyone that should anything happen, if the meeting gets Zoom bombed, please uh, know that we will immediately end the meeting and then we will send you information as to how we can um, come back together again. Uh, also, I know I was having some trouble with my um, internet connection today. So if for some reason you are having trouble, please feel free to turn off your video. Um, I may even have to myself today a bit, um, but feel free to turn off your video. That should help uh, somewhat. And please stay muted when you're not speaking. Um, and we'll remind you if you start to speak, we'll remind you to unmute if, if you haven't remembered to do that yourself. So thanks again, everyone. Um, I'm going to read again our statement um, of the indigenous heritage of the land to start our meeting today. We humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And with that, I will turn it over to Gudzi Kaya. Thanks, Stephanie. So uh, today you may notice that we do not have ASL interpretation, but we're going to continue to encourage everyone to speak at a just thoughtful, um, slow pace uh, to allow us all to reflect on what we will be uh, talking about. And we're gonna have you uh, raise your hand before you speak again so that we have a nice, um, thoughtful pace to the conversation. And I'm just going to remind us of the agreements that we went over last week and then, or not last week, last meeting, and then offer if anyone uh, has one that they would like to adjust or something else that they'd like to add. So we talked about um, putting people and relationships first to remember that these issues affect um, real people in their real lives and uh, that um, we're, we're not here to win or to get individual goals met, to, but to really understand each other and work from that place. Um, anytime you need to take a break to check in with children or to get a snack or to step away to use the restroom, whatever you need, we encourage you to just go ahead and take care of yourself and um, step away as you need. Uh, we want to avoid uh, jargon or technical terms as much as possible um, and to keep that slow, steady pace. Um, if you tend to be a quiet person, we want to support you in speaking more. And if you tend to be a person who um, has a lot to say, consider sharing a bit less and allowing for um, that silence to invite um, everyone to share. And we want to remember to keep everything that is shared here private and to not dig for um, more details or personal stories if they're not being offered uh, and not to ask for proof um, when people state their needs. Um, and then the last one is just to always remember that um, we want to stick with our own experiences uh, and consider that our versions of right and wrong are most likely related to our cultural values and um, are likely to differ from others in the room. So um, be open to learning by asking a lot of questions. And lastly, when you um, are at the first time that you share, go ahead and introduce yourself with your name and your pronouns, which I failed to do when I started. So I'm Gazit Chaya, my pronouns are they, them. Um, and the first piece, unless, oh, I wanted to make sure and pause. Did anyone have adjustments that they wanted to make to those agreements or something that they think is important to add for our group?
Okay. And if something comes up midway, oh, Jim, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, just quick, um, you know, we do take notes of everything. And I just want to sort of one of the things I think is, uh, is worthy as a part of an agreement is that everything that everybody says, while it's not going to be attributed to anybody, we, get, we are taking that down so that things don't get lost. Uh, you know, you may make a point or a comment that, uh, that uh, the conversation moves in some other direction after that, that comment will be, we're going to hold on to all of those things. So nothing gets lost in this process. Great, thank you, Jim. And the flip of that is also to remember that while we ha just have this group together right now, this recording is made public. So anything that you don't want to become public, um, just keep that in mind and keep that to yourself. And we're always willing outside of meeting time to have you share thoughts that, that won't be recorded and um, made public that you maybe want to make more anon anonymously. Okay. So um, the next piece uh, that- Sorry, oh, um, Ludmilla yes. has her hand up as well. Oh, thank you. I was just mo learning how to use the process and I think it's very good. <laughs> I'm happy to raise my hand when I have something to say. I also wanted to follow up a little bit on the notes and on the initial statements by asking for a reminder of the purpose of this group. Um, because I even Chris, I think, mentioned the question earlier, what is the goal, what is the purpose of the building task force? What are we hoping to accomplish at the end of the day? And um, I wanted to thank everybody for the notes. Um, I did read them thoroughly. I followed up with Gazette with a question. It was answered again thoroughly. I appreciated the um, clarifications. So thank you for running a great process and let's just keep going. Sounds great. Thanks, Ludmilla. Um, uh, this is Jim Newman. Uh, I use uh, he, him, and his uh, pronouns. Um, we'll, uh, I'm going to let Gazikaya sort of finish. Uh, and then when I start my process, we'll, I'll br briefly review uh, the purpose of the, the process after uh, Jesse and Sarah get a chance to do uh, their sort of introduction. So thanks, we'll get to that for sure. Okay, so Jim, did you want me to go ahead with the homework then? Okay, great. Okay, so I was going to just touch on some of the highlights from those who gave feedback on the homework questions. Thank you to those of you who were able to do that. Um, and if anyone had not had the opportunity to send in their responses to those questions, um, you can still send those in and they'll still be made a part of um, all of the information that we're gathering. So um, if you didn't get a chance, I encourage you to still uh, send me responses if you have them. Um, our question was around, um, what are people's experiences with buildings that were fixed quickly and cheaply? versus more slowly and for the long term. Um, most of the responses that I got were around housing and landlords. And there were um, about eight or, eight or 10 experiences of having things fixed only when they were at um, a very broken point and um, just enough to get uh, appliances or things functional. Um, several comments about things being done um, by, I think the term was used like a um, jack of all trades type of a um, handy person at um, a complex and the feeling was that things hadn't been specifically fixed by an expert so that they were um, needing repairs very often and that the materials were the cheapest um, so that they, um, again, needed repairs very often. Uh, lots of landlords coming in and out of people's space to um, 
repeatedly repair the same things. Uh, and let's see, um, the other comment was about the roads, which I know is not necessarily about buildings, but um, someone had shared that the roads need to be fixed so many times and that they constantly need to be um, fixed again. Um, another uh, theme was around um, the, the outside of apartment complexes uh, not being kept up to the same extent that um, maybe the inside repairs happen, but the outside repairs really rarely happen. Um, so those were some of the themes that came through and thanks again to everybody who did give their input and please send any further information that you have. Fantastic, thanks Jessica. Um, and uh, you know, those are topics that we can get to in our conversation as we go along. Uh, I'm now gonna uh, hand the process over to Sarah uh, and Jesse for, uh, oh, John does have his hand raised. Thank you, John. Where are you? You gotta uh, unmute just yourself. Just need to unmute, yeah. Um, I just had one comment on what Gazit Shaya had to say, and that is she focused entirely on the responses related to people who are renting. I know you got at least one comment from a person who's a homeowner, and the only reason I bring it up is not because I feel neglected, but because my experience as a homeowner is so different from that of renters. Homeowners are much better positioned to control their ability to deal with these building issues. And so I, I think it's important to keep that in mind that uh, this is probably uh, not exclusively, but primarily an issue for people who are renters. And that part of our job is to see if we can uh, find a way to put them in a better position than they are now. Great, thanks, John. Good, good. Uh, uh, any, does anybody else have uh, their own uh, information from the homework process? Homework, another bad term, but hey, it was sort of like homework. Great, thank you, Ludmilla. Your hand is up. Or is it? My still hand is up because I. Yes, this is Ludmila Pavlova Gillam, and my pronouns are she, hers. I'm, I'm going to try and start my video as well. I apologize for not having sent the responses. I think they were sitting in my draft folder um, and never got sent out because I was trying to answer thoroughly. And I had also queried other people in District 1 using my District 1 uh, neighborhood association to see if others wanted to work with me in um, helping me provide feedback to this task force. Unfortunately, our process is a little clunky at this time, so I wasn't able to receive any feedback. But um, as I have a, I, I could give it to you verbally if you would like now, or I can send it to you by email. What would you prefer? You can go ahead and share it now. Okay, so on the buildings question, I can tell you that also I'm a, a homeowner. I have uh, used all of the possible mass save program incentives to air seal my house and to provide insulation in the attic. Um, I'm currently looking at replacing a very old oil burning boiler but my budget is not permitting very much. We have to be sure that we can afford the payback of the loan over the next five to 10 years, however long that takes. And so it's a more complex evaluation for us, but I know there are 0% uh, in interest loans that are available from MassSave and I'm looking at um, those possibilities. So I do have experience with short-term projects and those were 
specifically in my home with the Mass Save program, but I also have experience with long-term projects as a, an architect and project manager at UMass because we do large-scale commercial buildings and institutional buildings. On the transportation question, it's, um, I recently, yes. I'm maybe gonna have for the other groups, why don't you just um, email me those? Just for the sake of us. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you so Great. much. Thank you. We'll do. Awesome. Uh, Sarah and Jesse, you're on. Great. So maybe you can see the screen. Yep. Should be. And you'll have to forgive me, even though I draw for a living, I'm not super good at it. We'll let Sarah talk. Thank you, Jesse. I think it's great. I like it. Um, I'm Sarah. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Oh, yeah. He, and him. I'm Sorry. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so in our previous meeting, Jesse identified two key goals for our work, which is to increase the quality of life and decrease carbon as it relates to buildings in Amherst. So I'm going to speak for a few minutes on the reduction of carbon in buildings. And the goal of this conversation is simply to offer up some shared language and definitions and as you can see, as I speak, Jesse will provide some visuals on screen to hopefully help illustrate. So I'm going to go over three key terms and define them a little bit and give some examples. Um, they are operational carbon, embodied carbon, and a system boundary. So the first one, operational carbon, this refers to the greenhouse gas emissions that come from people using a building. So this includes all the things that we do both in and around our buildings that require energy. So examples would be the use of hot water, heating and cooling, plugging in a toaster, using your computer, turning on lights, etc. This energy can be sourced from gas, oil, wood, or electricity. And generally there are two strategies that work together to reduce operational carbon. The one is to just use less energy, right? To not plug in our toaster as often, or two, use cleaner energy, or perhaps a combination of both. So right now, clean energy is available via solar and wind, so sun and wind, and it comes to us in the form of electricity. So for buildings specifically, we're looking to eliminate unclean energy, such as burning fuels like gas or oil, and instead install equipment that uses electricity from a clean source. So operational carbon, the way we use buildings and, and the carbon that they emit is relatively easy to measure. And there are proven pathways um, to eliminate it. And in the case of a net zero building, you may have heard this term a lot. Net zero means that a building produces as much energy so for example, via solar, right? It creates that energy. It produces as much as it consumes and they offset. So both new and existing buildings can be net zero energy or even produce an excess of electricity. So this little scenario is, is one important piece of the puzzle. And that's generally speaking, <laughs> um, how we can think about operational carbon. The second term, embodied carbon, refers to the emissions that come from the entire process of creating or renovating a building. So for example, 
the process of manufacturing and making concrete that goes into a building releases a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases before the building is even occupied. And those things need to be accounted for in the total of embodied carbon. Other materials that require a lot of energy produce or we could call them high in embodied carbon include glass, steel, and the high-tech components of mechanical systems or insulation, for example. So as you can probably start to think, embodied carbon is a little harder to and, and more difficult to measure than operational carbon because it looks at the entire process of building or renovating a building. So I'll give an example. Um, we could factor in to the process of renovating a building the gasoline that's required for all of those materials to be transported from their source to the building. So the gasoline that that truck burned, right, in order to help renovate that building would factor into the embodied carbon amount. So you can see how things like that get tricky depending on how we define it. Um, but this is also where it gets exciting. There are building materials that hold carbon and can be used to make building projects carbon negative, like a tree, for example, that absorbs carbon from the air to produce wood. And in fact, lumber used in buildings when it's properly harvested can do this. And more examples would include things like um, fiber, fibers of hemp or straw. So this means the initial act of fixing an old building or building new can have a positive impact right now. And that's where we need it most in the near in the near term right now. So the last term is system boundary. And a system can be whatever you define it as, um, a school, a property, Jesse's town that we're looking at right now, the earth. Um, we can define a boundary to keep us honest and not get too overwhelmed. So for example, if we think back about a net zero energy building, in that system, we look at the operational energy used and produced by the building. And that's a relatively easy and manageable system boundary to understand. We can then expand the boundary of that, right, to look at the source of the energy. Is it coming from wind or is it coming from a coal-fired power plant? Um, we can also look at embodied carbon, embodied carbon um, how we build it, how long it lasts, how long it lasts. And that tends to get more complex and it's harder to analyze. But expanding our boundary in this way is much more likely to lead to a lower carbon result. And a system analysis also looks at other factors that we're really interested in, such as human behavior, mindsets, economies, etc., which then feed back into how a building is used and where energy is consumed, um, and then also how it can be reduced and ultimately how we can enhance the quality of life, which is really important to us. So where we decide to draw the boundary of a system um, may affect the type of actions that we then end up taking to reduce carbon. So the goal of presenting these definitions is to step into the weeds a little bit um, in order to keep us from getting maybe too distracted by them to keep the conversation moving with a beginning of a shared understanding of these terms, some examples, some kind of time to think through, um, which then lets us look at analyzing specific actions. So in summary, brief summary, we have operational carbon, which results from producing the energy, sorry, the energy used to operate a building, what we do in and around the building, embodied carbon or the energy used to make or renovate a building and then the systems boundary which are kind of the inter interrelated parts that help us decide how we're going to analyze our options thank you jesse for your lovely lovely sketching um if oh, that feels you. like a lot I agree. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot for me. Um, even as I was speaking, I was 
tripping a little bit over where I was in, in the overall thought. Um, so if there are questions now, we can probably dialogue a little bit. I'm not sure, Jim. Um, or we can make time to speak offline with Jesse, Jim, myself, or, or anyone else. I think um, I think it takes like quite a few reads and it takes a lot. It takes a lot of reads to really like get it to, to sink in. So, yeah. Um, I would highly recommend if people have questions right now about that description and the lovely pictures, <laughs> um, go ahead and now's a good time to ask. And you can just speak up in this situation because I can't see everybody. And I'm going to let Jesse or Jim answer those questions. <laughs> I want to know about the magic of drawing on there. That's incredible. Thank you. That's so cool. Yes, I would echo that. Very helpful, Jesse. Nicely done. Um, why uh, you said the system boundary widening the system boundary tends to reduce the amount of energy sent into the atmosphere i don't understand that please explain that so i think it the idea is we're using this concept of a system boundary to define what we're talking about for two reasons one is sometimes we need to keep it simple i think in the example of net zero if we're looking at one building and one solar array, you know, we count the amount of energy it produces, we count the amount of energy it uses, right? It's a very simple analysis. It's math, an electric meter can sum it up for us. But if we draw a slightly more complex system boundary that maybe looks at, well, here's the factory that makes with our pink stuff that makes the solar panels. And so we draw that circle that includes that factory. Now we have to offset, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do solar, but now it's a more complicated analysis, but it's a more truthful one. Well, there was energy required to make those solar panels. So we need to be sure they're gonna offset that. Or in the case of a new building, there is, in, this embodied energy, all the energy it took to make a new building, that happens right away. And so if we don't look at that wider view, we could be missing um, large amounts of emissions and, and maybe not make the best decisions. This is really designed, how do we make good decisions? How do we make smart decisions? Um, yeah, I think that's a great description, Jesse, and that's, why I think one of the things that is worth worth commenting about is in, including people in those boundaries and people's experiences. Because Kaya. Um, I appreciate it, Jesse, that you said the reason why we're talking about this is because this is the way that we can, or this is a tool to help us make decisions about what, like new buildings or also fixing old buildings. Is that correct? Yes. And I, I mean, I think ultimately these, these three terms, I think are kind of boiled down a lot of, and a lot of, a lot of decisions. It could be to decide a new building versus a renovation. It could be, um, it could also be, and this kind of goes outside of the building's task group, but uh, an example that comes to mind is this someone mentioned fixing the roads. And if that's an energy intensive process, and if you have to do it every five years, no one's asking what the, you know, no one's saying what's a net zero road look like, but, but we need to draw a circle around our, our Amherst system that includes, you know, the manufacturing of that asphalt, for example. And, at the risk of, but also not make it so complicated that we can't make decisions. So I think it's just helpful for all kinds of decisions. Do we replace the boiler? Do we, a great one might be ventilation. Do we improve the ventilation? Well, let's, the system would include the people in the building, uh, the energy the new system uses or the energy the new system saves. 
um, the embodied energy of that piece of equipment. And, and we look at all those things and then decide in this case, well, yeah, the new ventilation at the school is a great idea. It's going to save energy. It's going to improve people's lives and it's going to make, you know, a safer space. And sorry, I just had a few more questions. Um, one is about, can you uh, define this word offset that you're using? Yes. So uh, let's say I, let's say for um, strictly for energy, if I plug in a toaster and make toast, uh, which I love, um, that uses so much electricity. And to offset that, I would want to connect within that system to something that's generating that much electricity without the use of coal or natural gas um, or other dirty power sources. So let's say there's a town solar field or solar on the roof or solar near the building that's feeding clean electricity. And I want to make sure that the amount of toast I make equals the amount of electricity, green electricity that's coming in. So it's that balance of energy used versus energy produced, clean energy produced. Okay, so was that has to do with when you're talking about net zero, it doesn't mean the building isn't using any energy. It means the amount of energy that is used is the same or less than how much energy is getting made by a solar or a wind thing? Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. The amount that gets used over the course of a year is is equal to or less than the amount that is being produced in a green in a you know a low emissions way okay thank you um i'm assuming can you hear me okay thanks uh that uh these are things we could embody in goals for building in Amherst. For example, if we're talking about adding affordable housing, we can talk about if there's new building to minimize the amount of embodied carbon in the design and construction of the building. And similarly, to minimize the amount of carbon once the building actually becomes operational, there are people in it, and so forth. So. Uh, the question I have is, are there good tools that would help us or others with that analysis and also would offer alternatives to, for example, whatever building materials you decided were going to go into a new building? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of tools and I think and I don't know, and, and I think Jim or someone interrupt me if we're getting too deep in the weeds. Um, there's a lot of tools coming out from the state. There's even new uh, building codes that are being developed as we speak. I think they just released the 2021 documentation that even includes the option for a state or a town to adopt a net zero energy building code. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting tools that are both happening kind of at a at a government scale, but also there are practitioners out there um, that have are able to deliver these buildings, these projects, um, help help groups measure their energy, help verify. There there is a, it. There, it's a whole industry. Um, <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> and yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so so uh, Jesse and um, uh, uh, Chris, um, this is a great, I think, tee up for us to move into the next stage of conversation uh, that really is aimed at defining so, so Chris, you're asking, well, how does, uh, you say, oh, John. there it is. Uh, 
sorry, Lamilla did put her hand up. Um, just a moment. Um, uh, how does, you know, how do we use a particular set of tools to achieve, you know, this net zero thing? Well, I think there's a good a point where we need to go before we start talking about tools to start understanding what is it we're trying to do uh, and where do, do these things really matter uh, and where do we want to push on them? Uh, what is it that this group feels are the most important places, activities, actions to really to really move some of these things forward. Uh, and I think then when we sort of land on those things, then there is a, a question about how do you implement those goals? And that's when we can start to talk about tools and why they're so important there. Uh, um, so I would uh, like to, um, so let me just remind everybody of the uh, um, sort of uh, principles that we came up with in the last gathering. Oh, before I do that, uh, Ludmilla, you had a question or a comment. I just had a comment on the system boundary because I thought um, it was worth repeating the, the second thought that um, I think Lauren or Sarah, uh, Sarah was providing. Yeah which is that a system boundary could also be used to define human systems. Um, and the one that always comes to mind for me, at least in this context, is financial boundaries um, and organizational boundaries. So who is going to do what, to what purpose? Um, are we working to ensure that the town of Amherst buildings reduce their carbon? Or are we hoping to define strategies and tools for all residents in Amherst and all businesses in Amherst to use? And businesses do different kinds of work and use a different set of energy um, in terms of scale than residences do. Um, so, and, and they also have different financial options the financing available to the municipality of the town of Amherst is different from what's available to me as a homeowner. It's different to what's available to a commercial operator. So the economy piece of it and the people and activities piece of it, which is really important when defining systems and the system boundaries of what you're talking about, um, are always kind of essential for me to think about because then I really understand who's involved, who's committed to doing something and who's expected to be brought in, in and educated or engaged or supported so they could also take action. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great comment. Um, okay, Jesse. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's huge. Um, I think one of the examples that just want to quickly say is, you know, if you were to analyze our town, the municipal buildings represent maybe 3% of the carbon emissions. But if you include in their system boundary, all the people that are looking at those buildings, all the people that interact with those buildings, all the people that could be inspired by those buildings, it might actually be a really good place to invest in these improvements in, in low embodied carbon, low operational carbon, um, et cetera. So I think that's an example that really points to what you're saying, Ludmilla. Um, where, where are the dollar signs? Where, what are people seeing? How are we inspiring each other? How are, how, how are we affecting each other? And I think that, uh, um, that, uh, that question about uh, sort of who, who's inside the boundary and who's not inside the boundary is a really important one. We were talking a lot about earlier, uh, Gazichaya was talking about uh, sort of the experiences of people renting uh, apartments and, you know, what the, the experiences of 
people renting apartments with things happening in those buildings. Uh, so, you know, are, is somebody who rents within a building part of the boundary? And if the answer is yes, well, then that's going to change how we think about what we're actually doing uh, within those buildings. And obviously the answer is yes, but, but, um, but it, it changes the answers in a way. Uh, yeah, because he kind of, and then Chris. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, throw out there that I really appreciate seeing this once, but like Sarah said, this takes a while to absorb these concepts and that many of the people in this meeting have had a previous exposure to this information. So for those of us who are not necessarily ready to formulate a question because we're still digesting, um, there's going to be more opportunity um, to look through this again at, you know, to take it, take time with it. Um, and I, I wanted to just add to what you had just said, Jim, that if you're considering you know, who's in the system, it might also be um, helpful to consider and what kind of power do they have within that system? Um, because you might, you know, need to adjust how, like what role they play based on the power that they have or don't have and how the other people in the system need to, you know, advocate for them or shift that power to include them. And add That's to that big. quick, add yeah, quickly who benefits or who suffers from certain actions and what are the, what are the unintended consequences? A great example from our last meeting was uh, the bikes that took away the access to the buses. Um, so really understanding and, you know, or who owns the energy. Um, who, who benefits if the price if the price of energy goes down? Who benefits if it goes up, et cetera? Great. Yeah, that's, that's ideal. Um, Chris, do you have something uh, quick to say? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I th at least one of our goals, I think, is, it should be, um, to um, address climate change. Um, and the international intergovernmental panel on climate change says we should be to net zero by 2050. So I, th I would say that we should be to net zero by 2050. I, I, I think that's the, the future of the planets at stake and that should be a pretty important consideration. Um, if that were so, if the town of Amherst were to uh, decide to be a net, to do what it takes, to get to net zero by 2050, um, there are, are pretty big implications uh, for a lot of, in, in a lot of areas. The area that I'm particularly focusing on is the existing building stock. Um, uh, there are a lot of buildings in town. There you go. Uh, there probably are mostly residential and then some commercial. I think that the intent is that our, um, the limits of our what's your phrase, Jesse? The the our 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 scope range does not include the university and the two colleges. Um, that's something we I don't know if we formally adopted that, but let's assume that that is so. So we're talking about the existing building stock in the town of Amherst. Um, I did a rough calculation that um, so there's a there's a suggestion that that. That, that suggests that we need to upgrade the buildings in town so that they are energy efficient and that we need to invest in uh, clean energy in some way. Um, and uh, the, that has very vast, just saying, okay, well, let's, let's upgrade all the buildings in town so that they are very energy efficient and then so, so that they can be um, uh, close to net zero. There are a lot of buildings in town. And if you go out and walk around, you will get uh, astounded by the scope of the problem to say, okay, yeah, all of these buildings have to be net zero. I figured it, I, I round numbered a figure of a billion dollars to, uh, to upgrade the buildings and add uh, the $100, I used a $100 a square foot 
and tried to figure out how many square foot there were. It's, it's a very approximate gross calculation. It's a huge number. So if you spent a billion dollars on all the buildings in town, um, you could uh, get, get, the, get the building stock to be net zero. And there would be a strong benefit to all of the owners of all of those buildings and all of the users of all of those buildings to doing that. Um, they would have a much more comfortable spaces. They, would have, they wouldn't have drafts and they would have a much lower cost of energy. Um, uh, that's fine for a lot of people like me who have a house and I, can, uh, I could upgrade my house and John could probably upgrade his and, and uh, Lou could probably upgrade hers and so forth over the course of 30 years and we'd be better off for it. But what about the rental stock? That's, that is, to my eye, the biggest question. How do we upgrade all of the apartments in town? In, in a way that uh, allows the same residents to stay there and, um, and allows there to be, um, that not, it keeps it from being too terribly disruptive. And where's that money coming from? As far as I'm concerned, that's the question. That's the thing that we have to answer. How do we deal with the existing rental housing in the town of Amherst in a way that makes it energy efficient and allows the same people to stay where they are and rent there and not have uh, an, uh, and not have to move out and have the place, spaces be gentrified. That's my that's my speech. <laughs> nice speech, Chris. Thanks. Uh, um, that you uh, you point up a couple of key values that uh, I think are embodied in some of the principles, which I'll go over in a sec uh, about uh, sort of who where benefits should live. Uh, upgrading and, and improving the quality of life and the quality of buildings, especially for people who don't have control over those buildings, i.e. Who, who are renting or who are using them in other ways, uh, and to, uh, to not do it in a way that displaces anybody. I think those are, those are great values to include in this, in this process. Uh, Gazi Kaya, do you want to um, add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks, Chris, for mentioning the concept of not displacing people or making it too difficult for people. Um, I had forgotten about that when uh, one of the first places I lived here was uh, Pomeroy Lane at the, the, I guess it's Amherst Housing Authority um, houses in P Pomeroy Lane, and they changed the windows, which I think was like a probably to make them more efficient or something better. But me and my next door neighbor were both um, like eight and a half months pregnant when they decided to do it. And it was gonna kick up all this craziness. And my next door neighbor was planning a home birth, which she like went ahead and did with no windows, which was just, she's like a <laughs> remarkable, like amazing adaptive human who is just very resilient. I had like a, I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't imagine bringing home a baby to no windows. So we ended up moving, but we lost our place in public housing because of that, because they just like wouldn't, they had no other options for us. Um, they wouldn't even put us up in like a hotel for a couple of nights. Um, and it was really uh, just ended up creating a lot more problems because the other place we moved to the maybe there's some sort of message here but the the landlord took the doors off the day I went to the hospital <laughs> and I was like oh my gosh like this this baby deserves to have some windows and doors um and it was all just like really really stressful um so keeping that as a principle I think to remember that like sometimes maybe people don't think about the people who are actually living there and they're like, oh, well, you should be happy we're upgrading it. And um, it can be just really, really hard to deal with having no say in how or when that happens. Yeah, the disruption is key. Um, thank you both. Uh, so the, and when we lo looked at, when we developed principles at the last meeting, uh, um, there are sort of four things that came up. There were a bunch of other things that came up as well. And those things are all, you know, in the notes and you've seen a lot of them and all that. 
you know, is incorporated into this process. Uh, but the, the four sort of big principles, uh, one of them was to prioritize accessibility of buildings for all residents, including physical access and healthy and supportive spaces. Um, one of them was to prioritize uh, the accessibility within governance and decision making structures and uh, processes to support inclusive community participation to help us meet our goals. Um, which sort of both this this conversation is talking about both of those uh, principles and they're such great principles that I'm, I'm thrilled to to uh, sort of use them as guides uh, along with the values that uh, that um, Chris was articulating. Um, a third one is to prioritize actions that improve the quality of life for all residents, especially those most vulnerable uh, while reducing carbon emissions. Um, I think we're pretty clearly connecting to that. And then the fourth yes, is- I'm so sorry. I just want to interrupt you for just a second. Janine, unfortunately, needs to head out. Um, mm. She's got something going on with her Do kids, but I wanted to thank Janine for being here um, and just have everyone give a, um, see you soon, Janine, and thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank Bye. Thank, thank you, Janine. Janine. Um, do, uh, right. Uh, I was going to ask Janine if she wants to say something uh, a little bit ago. Sorry. Yeah. She's, she's got a, a crisis with her kids. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's too bad. Um, great. Thanks. Cause you can, uh, so then the, the fourth principle is to connect clean energy and carbon neutrality to all aspects of life in Amherst so that everyone has a reason to care and get involved and get involved. Um, those principles speak to A, the goals that Chris was talking about, which is, look, we know we have goals that are important climate goals that we're trying to reach because those goals affect all of us. Uh, and we also know that there's lots of different pathways to get there. And that, as you say, Chris, yes, we're going to have to somehow touch every building and we're going to have to somehow, you know, change how people move around. And we're going to have to think about all of those things. We're going to have to change how we deal with outdoor spaces. And, uh, but the question is, how do we do that? Who participates? Who benefits? How do we think about that moving forward? So, um, to sort of guide that conversation forward, uh, we, um, we identified uh, sort of the, the, uh, the two co-chairs uh, and uh, myself and Lauren and Stephanie working with the notes that we uh, took from the last meeting, identified a couple of what we're kind of recall recalling big moves or big things. Uh, and there are things that we've already been talking about. Uh, the first is uh, getting to net zero energy and net zero carbon for rental housing. So obviously it's a topic we've already talked about. Uh, the second is to just, to just get to and touch and renovate ex all existing buildings. Again, what Chris was talking about. Um, and so we sort of, what we decided was that we'd uh, ask the, sort of set those two topics up and then start uh, our sort of jump back into a, a, a wider range discussion, which we've already done pretty well at, um, with a couple of questions about those. Uh, one of those questions is what needs do those actions address in town? Who will be most impacted by those actions? Uh, and then, um, and we could probably start there. Uh, the second question, which is what are the different kinds of potential carbon reductions related to this action? Um, I think that those both are great questions for us to uh, to get involved in 
looking at first that question of getting rental housing to net zero, and second, the question that Chris so eloquently uh, stated of having to touch every existing building and what does that really mean and how, who benefits, who, who does it hurt, who does it impact. Uh, uh, so I'll open that up for questions and answers around those topics. And if you think there's something we've missed, let's hear about it. You can just jump in. Go ahead, Lydia. Um, yeah, oh, I don't know. My mind's kind of going crazy about a lot of things. Uh, Lydia Vernon Jones, I use she, her. Um, I'm remembering, uh, I'm old enough that uh, I was young right after World War II, and I heard stories from my families about things that the government forced everybody to do for the welfare of everybody. And um, in our community here, there's been, um, you know, just watching how decisions are made. Um, there's always a lot of worry about forcing anybody to do something they don't, they don't want to do or stepping on people's toes or whatever. But I've been recently reading about communities that have actually taken some brave stands, uh, New York City being one of them. Uh, and putting big requirements on people. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can start at a point where we know probably everybody's gonna suffer because everybody does suffer under climate change, that we do wanna improve our quality of life, but that may mean a very different thing than we're used to under capitalism. Um, uh, it, you know, it may not mean that we're all gonna get richer or you know, have nicer things or whatever, or even warmer places or cooler places. So I, you know, I just want us to um, be uh, bold initially and not just wait for boldness to have to happen five or 10 or 15 years down the road, but to really think about like, could we be a model as a city? Um, could we really, take on uh, all the absentee landlords that we have in this town. I, I campaigned door to door a couple of years ago and I really saw the, the condition of, of much of the, the rental stock, the small build, the small houses that are, you know, uh, mostly student occupied um, and what poor condition that they're in and trying to imagine them upgrading, you know, but yeah, so, yeah, really taking on um, some of the those those tough things so that renters don't have to suffer, that the landlords have to suffer, um, which actually is happening right now under COVID, where people aren't, you know, are being excused from having to pay rent. But um, yeah, so I want us to be bold, and uh, I mean, I just read yesterday about making new buildings be bird bird proof in new york city bird if you friendly. build a new building it has to not kill you know 80 percent of the birds in town or whatever uh because the glass you know is such that the birds right run right into it and that you know but there's a lot of people who love birds and if you can make new buildings like that why not make them you know so anyway <laughs> Uh, it is, but that, I mean, okay, so there's a sort of thought about we should, how do, what does it mean to be bold? What does it mean to be bold in this situation? Emily, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm Emily Boss, uh, she, her, hers. Um, and I, this may have been discussed at other meetings, but I um, wanted to go to the um, systems boundaries point and just make a comment about thinking about buildings and also thinking about the external outside and natural spaces and the effects that they have because those can be strong on energy use um, also human and wildlife um, experience jesse did you have a point there did you want to uh, before jesse before you get going emily you want to do you have some specific thoughts around that I just wanted to make two points about the indoors and outdoors, siting and 
building and there's a lot of impacts that um, trees and green spaces can have in terms of energy use. And then also on the other side, um, this is beyond the purview perhaps of a group talking about buildings specifically, but if we then look at the town as a whole, thinking about the green spaces is another place where we can think about our overall impact on carbon. Um, and I work, I work for the Franklin Land Trust and work on conservation. So that's, that's a part, very much part of the equation for me. And, and then there was also access and accessibility and social equity issues always with them um, on conservation and natural space and parks. So those are things to keep in mind too. So I just wanted to raise all those issues to have them be part of the conversation. That's all, thank you. Fantastic, Jesse, yeah. Well, I just, one of the things, I, I'm really glad you brought this up um, because one of the things that's really exciting to me is the idea that there are these other groups right now that know what we're doing and we know what they're doing. And there is a group focused on land use. Um, there's another group, you know, we said to be net zero, you have to have, you know, reduce the energy and have the energy coming in be green. There's a whole group that's dedicated just to making the energy that comes to the buildings be um, low emissions, no emissions. So I, I think it just, I think it's, I just want to remind us that we are not the only ones talking about this and there is a very coordinated effort and it's kind of exciting and hearing Emily talk about the landscape and land use issues and know that if anyone has ideas that they think are relevant, not to buildings, but relevant to this larger system that we're talking about, bring them up, tell us because we can funnel that right to the other group and make sure they are hearing those ideas. So thank you. Um, I think the um, are perfectly reasonable to include outdoor spaces and adjacent outdoor spaces into a building boundary. Absolutely. Uh, um, and the, um, the role of uh, uh, so, you know, outdoor spaces can affect energy use from a shading perspective, uh, reducing d energy demand in warmer days. They can uh, improve uh, um, the sort of stormwater management uh, uh, if you know in days in situations where it's raining a lot you get big uh, downpours of rain which you know is another part of the sort of adaptation or resilience thinking looking ahead dealing with climate change but they also have big effects on how people feel and we know that that's the case and that's probably worth as much as any of the other things uh, and um, that that sort of understanding, it was like, no, people's health, which includes their mental health, is part of the boundary that we want to be thinking about. Yeah, uh, Gazika. Oh, Lauren had a hand up, and then oh, after, sorry. after you say something, Lauren, I was just gonna um, comment on what Jim said. Sure, thanks. Um, hi all, Lauren, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I just wanted to jump off what Emily was saying. Um, and for those of you that were in the last meeting, you heard me speak about my appreciation for the UMass um, design building, which is a building that incorporates natural elements um, on the outside to make the building itself more sustainable. And just kind of wanted to offer up a thought around thinking about um, how our buildings connect to their environments and integrate with their environments and support their environments. Um, because I think what I appreciate about that building and, and sort of um, am considering as a, a potential way of thinking about building projects more just in my sort of career and in general is as, um, as extensions of our, our natural environment or just as things that can be more integrated with our natural environments in, in ways that are mutually sustaining and supportive. I was just going to comment that I really um, 
appreciated hearing Jim that the idea of the trees and the you know the nature around the building being included I know we're talking about it in the land use group um, land use group but I like the idea of thinking about it here too because um, like they they have cut down like 20 trees in our complex in the past two years and we've all really noticed that it's a lot hotter um, but also the kids are really sad like they had like relationships with the trees you know and like it's always like a funeral every time they cut down another one and um, so I really like the idea of keeping it also as a topic here um, so that it would be a conversation with landlords um, separate from I feel like in the land use we're talking more about like recreation which maybe that's also a place to you know talk to landlords that like that's an important part of having a complex is to think about the outdoor space um but but i'm glad to to have it brought up here also um so thanks for making that connection that's uh i think that's that's a, a great comment and i'd i'd uh counsel us to not uh, get too involved in how to achieve the things we're at, talking about achieving right now. But we'll have a whole other conversation about how we achieve things. Um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, changing what happens in rental housing and ar around rental housing, let's just set the goals. Like what, what needs to happen here? And we'll figure out, a, you know, once we know what the goals are, we'll see if we can figure out a way to actually make it happen. Uh, and you know, that way may take a lot of different turns and paths, and we know that. Um, Stephanie, yeah. So, I mean, I, of course, uh, you know, absolutely believe that the natural landscape contributes a lot to the quality and the sustainability of our buildings. I think there's also an entire industry that is so entrenched in doing things in a very specific way. And I always appreciate architects like Jesse or Chris who are definitely forward thinking, but I think about the contractors and the developers who come in to just get things done quickly in a very routine sort of way. And I think, you know, there, I think, you know, how we do this, I know, Jim, you don't want to focus on that too much, but I do think there's just a way in which to really bring that mindset, to alter that mindset and to change that mindset is so important because it's, it is, again, it's so embedded in sort of process and just, we do things a certain way and that's how we do it because we've done it this way and it's quick and it's easy and we need to get it done. And I think changing that whole framework is really important. Like that's just such an important piece of all of this. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, working in town, I deal with people on, from all different kinds of perspectives. Um, some which are very different from those that we're all expressing here and who don't even see this as an issue. Um, so it's trying to sort of change that framework as well. I think that's really, it's just important. And I think that's where the education piece comes in and where the leading by example comes in. John, you've been relatively quiet. It's because he's muted. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I've just been listening to this group and then one thing I find interesting is that it appears to be a pretty sophisticated group. People have a lot of experience, not only uh, personally, but it appears uh, professionally with dealing with these kinds of issues, um, which I think is great. I think it's really helpful. I mean, at some point, uh, particularly listening to Stephanie just now, um, we should point to the places in town government that we want to influence. And I don't just mean 
people, but I also mean things like zoning bylaws or other kinds of regulations um, which need to change if we're going to reach the kinds of goals that we've been talking about. I, I, absolutely. Uh, that uh, is no question there. <laughs> I love that. I love that comment. Um, I think that's so I, one of the things when I hear Stephanie's comment and then your comment, John, one of the phrases that comes to mind is how do we make the right thing to do the path of least resistance as opposed to, you know, if you're trying to do something good, why is it so hard and where, where are the stumbling blocks? Where on that process? And is it the zoning? Um, you know, is it the building code? Do we need to have a whole town department that's designed to lobby the state to improve the building code because that's where that gets changed. And it's really, it, I, it, I think you're spot on with that. Chris. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to point out my recent experience with the building of the Hitchcock Center and the Kern Center. Um, there, uh, there really was a change uh, that was affected with in the building trades um, uh, that Jonathan Wright uh, documents in his book on this topic, uh, probably worth uh, reading. Um, but uh, the, by the end of the process, the, the, the tradespeople who did the work became um, uh, understood what was behind building, building a living building. These are both uh, two living buildings that are at the Hampshire campus. and. Uh, uh, there was a definite change in mindset there. It wasn't just get it done fast. It had to be, they understood the, the, the guys pretty much, the guys and ladies pretty much understood at the end of the process that, uh, that there, were, there were bigger issues at, at stake there. Stephanie, yeah. And then Sarah, yeah. I think that's a great example, Chris, and I want to um, dovetail on that, that I was really proud of a lot of my colleagues um, in planning and inspections who worked on that project because it was a really unique situation where there wasn't necessarily regulations that addressed some of the things that were happening um, or allowed for the permitting and somehow they found a way to make it work. And that was expressed when the um, building was completed and they had a, a, um, a ribbon cutting and a you know um, ceremony around uh, opening the building and I think that to me that was an example of yes we can we can make these ha things happen I think it's easier when they're thinking about oh this is just the one project and somehow they can make it work for that one project but I think that's where we need to sort of expand on that thinking, like you made it happen. You didn't necessarily have everything right in, before you. You didn't have the regulations right before you to make it work, and yet you did. So how can we do this on the bigger scale? I think it's just that kind of thinking, like expanding what they did and expanding it into something broader and bigger for other buildings as well, not just one specific project. And I think, again, because it's easy to get your mind around that, but when you start talking bigger, people kind of, you know, put the brakes on a little bit. It's like too much change. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing we want to get to. Sarah, you also haven't had a whole lot to say since your beautiful soliloquy. <laughs> That's what we're calling it. <laughs> um, I'm loving every minute of this conversation. I'm trying to like facially be engaged because I, a lot of what's being said here is really exciting to me. Um, and I think what's striking me is as Stephanie and Chris and John were speaking about the last few threads, um, like what does it look like to not just be bold as Emily said, but to think outside of the box, right? Outside of the, the boundaries that keep us doing things the way that might be 
comfortable or routine or the way we have to do it. Um, so I'm just chewing on what, what does that look like, right? To create these like cross pollinating avenues of us to think about things in a really different way. I think that the example of thinking about uh, the rental housing complexes is a is a, is uh, is a good one for that thought because mm -hmm. we're the the problems if you follow the pathway that has been laid down from the, the problems are not solvable. So what that suggests is well we're not let's not follow that pathway. Uh, and so what it what's the new pathway? You know, how do mm -hmm. how do we change our mindset and our view to find a new pathway where the problems actually are the, solving the problems is the natural move, as Jesse describes it. One thing that I'm thinking of as we're talking is about how how hard we've worked to have um, the perspective of renters be in these meetings and how um, how it seems that that is going to have an impact in the the way that this plan is going to be put together and one of the like cultural shifts or systemic or institutional shifts that would be um, also really helpful here is to, to have it become an expectation that the, that renters are included in conversations, um, with town governance, like just that simple, that town governance consults with renters without a doubt since, you know, 40% of our residents are renters, um, and how, how can that be something that those participants in this group who are homeowners and who are likely to go on and be on other committees like this and other groups like this, how can, like, how can we support those people who will naturally be called upon and naturally have the capacity to serve in that way to look around rooms and to remember this experience and say, hey, I'm, I'm noticing that we don't have these voices in this room and I had an experience where we did and it had this impact and um, you know to because other committees or processes may not incorporate these voices um, and so how can the other people who are likely to be on committees again um, be a part of bring that back up. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. So thanks, Kizzy. In response to that, um, I'm curious, and Stephanie or Jim, or people who know more about the law and towns and, and things like that. I, one of the things that strikes me is um, who has um, disposable time uh, which tends to reflect people that have disposable income and are there ways to create compensation and unequal compensation um, for groups like this for town council is there you know is that something that we can put in a climate action plan that says um, raise the taxes on the, the top so that we can comp you know fully compensate the time of people who ordinarily couldn't afford to be at the table like is that appropriate um thing to do <laughs> so i'll you, you I'll got a certain you. amount of support in this room i gotta say yeah. so, i don't know if everyone knows this but the community leaders who are participating in this process are being paid and it is for that reason that we have had the ability it's that's the only way that i'm in this room um and that's the only way that all of the community leaders have been able to participate. And if we were not in Zoom, then they would have been also given 
access to childcare um, and food if a meeting was during a meal time. Um, and we have offered interpretation. Um, so the sort of magic four is like compensation. Well, five, I would add transportation would also be a consideration, right? So you need to make sure people can get where the meeting is, make sure they can have childcare, they can be paid, they can have food, and they can have interpretation or accessibility needs met. So yeah, it can certainly be laid out from what I understand in any type of a process if the people are willing to push for that. Well, and I would add to that that it's, so that was all made possible because it was written into a grant and there was specific funding allocated for it for this process. So I think part of that is getting the town, I mean, it was a model for the town, right? We wanted to create an opportunity to say, here's an example of how this can work. Um, but again, it, there, you know, it was outside funding that made it possible. So it's how does the town, you know, it's, again, it's that whole systemic thing of the town looking and prioritizing, like, what are the priorities in this town? What's important in this town? What, how, where do we, where do we put this? I mean, you've got 40% of people need to be resent, represented and heard in all town processes. And if that's not happening, then how do we create it so that it does. And I think one of the things that just sort of popped in my head, and I don't know how appropriate it is or not, but just even having, um, you know, a representative from each housing complex be able to represent their complex and be involved in decision making. And I don't know if that would be like a coalition of people or how, you know, I Kazi Kai, I'm seeing you nodding. So I'm looking, you know, you're, you're the, you're sort of leading the charge in a lot of this. So, you know, a, a way in which creating sort of an opportunity for a group like that to exist and how that group interacts with, you know, the, the various town boards and committees, um, you know, and again, it's just like getting the town to sort of look at this, getting the town council to sort of look at the, they're a new town go government, you know, it's a new town form of government. This is a great time to be doing this, right? It's a great time to be bringing it to their attention and to having them really look at this. Um, so anyway, that was just a few random thoughts I'm just sharing off the top of my head. <laughs> I'll just say briefly, so as not to take up, you know, too much time, but the Providence, Rhode Island uh, climate plan had, they spent an entire year beforehand formulating a racial justice and equity um, committee that, that that had then the town agree to a set of principles and then that committee consulted with and worked with their ECAC, their version of um, ECAC and and is also been made available to all the other committees in town from what I understand. So there are models out there where um, there is, you know, a lot of intentionality and consistency around bringing racial justice and equity um, which includes usually, uh, you know, issues of financial insecurity and housing insecurity and renters rights and all of that. Um, so there are models that where these kind of things have been brought to the forefront. Um, and I think everybody in town has heard me say at least 20 times that I think that um, community captains, representatives of each complex um, would be an excellent way to ensure that um, people's needs are being heard at least at a bare minimum. Yeah. And yeah, and I think, you know, having that, having that voice sitting right on the town council and being paid to do so seems like an appropriate way to move these ideas forward in, in, a, in a smart fashion. Yeah, I, that, that is such a, uh, it's such a clear and obvious I, sort of idea and set of goals. Um, and, uh, uh, and well, there may be three or four ways to actually make that happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting that it's such a, a strong statement from this, uh, from this task group. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try something a little weird here. Uh, 
And that is, in this conversation where we talk about representative uh, voices within decision-making structures, uh, are there people who have uh, something different to say? Are there people who have maybe seen some bad experience in that setting or something like that, that um, we might want to take into consideration as we're sort of thinking about how do we put this into a plan that would have an effect on uh, making it better, essentially. Sorry, I just have to jump in really quick. Ludmila had to jump off um, because she had an issue that she had to deal with. So she apologizes um, uh, and may join us again if she if she can. Great. I noticed that somebody jumped off and I couldn't remember who it was. Uh, um, I'll speak <laughs> since there's yeah. a moment of silence. Uh, yeah, we like silences. <laughs> The idea of paying people who otherwise don't have the time or the resources to be able to participate in town government processes is probably the most radical idea, maybe as radical as net zero, that we've discussed this afternoon. Um, we all white guys who are retired and are pretty happy with the way things are going now are not going to do stuff that would upset the apple cart. Uh, I mean, that's just the way this town government is running right now. There isn't a lot of openness to uh, looking inward, to looking at the ways in which we don't seek input from all sectors of the population of the town. Uh, it's not happening and there are any number of things that you could point to that happen every week in town council or in committees outside of town council that demonstrate that. So while I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, I do want to acknowledge that that's a huge hill to climb and that um, this is a very small group. Um, right now there are only, I think, five of us who are strictly speaking town residents, um, we need to be a much bigger group, not necessarily in these meetings, but in what we want to, uh, if we want to accomplish the kinds of goals that we're talking about. I would just throw out into the mix that the town manager and town council are currently discussing how to use $80,000 that have been that has been designated um, for some type of social justice effort. Um, and they're certainly seeking input. And that while we are not huge in numbers in this room or in this process, there are some very influential people, including yourself, John, <laughs> in this process. And I wouldn't, um, I, I, I think that, that the town generally is influenced by a small group of voices. And so those voices do actually have a ton of power. Um, yeah. This is a this is a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you know we had town meeting, which was becoming more diverse year by year, actually, um, and a certain group of people I think were very threatened and got rid of it, and now we have a much more conservative, less representative form of government. So we have our work cut out for us, but I think we've seen people. People of color organized in town more recently, and I think you know renters are going to have to figure out how to actually get um, a rental organization or or coalition or something. I think it's a great idea about representatives, but also just uh, whether funding could be found for a community organizer to really work be, you know, not within the system until there's enough kind of power and numbers there to to be able to come forward. 
um, I think is a, you know is a great idea, and I don't you know, I don't have a I don't have a funding source in my mind other than that eighty thousand dollars that could help organize um, mm -hmm. people. I, but I wanted to go back just to throw this in before we're done. Is that even though the town buildings are only three percent of the emissions in town, I think that when we when we retrofit and renovate and change them that will be in the public eye and it will be a model of what we need to do in the whole town so to not um you know not push that to the side as you know oh yeah eventually we're going to do that or whatever i think that um people will watch that process and hopefully learn from it and so to not ignore the that three percent i think that's a really cool uh chris you had your hand up i did um let's see um well i was just liking what lydia just said i, was, I wasn't i wasn't didn't mean to respond to that but uh, but i mean if you think uh in terms of say the town hall um turning the town hall into a net zero building is a pretty big challenge it's a brick building it's <laughs> uh and and so that would be a large expenditure that would be on the scale probably of the other big projects that we're talking about now. Certainly doing something like that would be very, would get everybody's attention and it would be a very good thing to do. So I like what you just said. Uh, the other thing, oh dear, what was the other thing? I've forgotten what the other thing is because I'm, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> uh, I think we all fall into that category. Uh, Stephanie and uh, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. I just wanted to say that um, I, you know, I agree and I'm glad Chris, you pointed out the expense of doing something like town hall, but then I also want to point out, and this is where we're in a little bit of a conundrum is that those projects do require a lot, a lot, a lot of capital. And when we're, and that's why I said something like when we look at prioritizing our needs, some of the things that we might do might not specifically address renovating a building. So I'm just going to sort of throw this out there just to put it on the table, but like it, I know it's not necessarily an and or, um, but if you're talking about, are we going to create funding for people to be more actively involved? And then we're also talking about renovating buildings. I mean, there's a lot of other categories and a lot of other things that have to happen in town um, that require capital funding. So I'm just saying these are the things that we need to look at prioritizing. I mean, sort of in my mind, yes, it's, it would be great to do that for town hall, but is the expense that it's going to cost to bring town hall to be a net zero building worth it as an example versus paying people to get more actively involved and have a voice in our process. I'm not saying it's necessarily one or the other, but I do think those are the kinds of questions that come up because if we're talking about all doing this for all town buildings, it's a lot. Uh, Jesse, yeah, go ahead. Interesting side note, um, <laughs> North, Northampton has issued an RFP for seven buildings, all of which I think are bigger than our town hall. They're all load-bearing masonry buildings, similar. They're all basically big versions of our town hall. There's seven of them. And they're issued an RFP to make them net zero. Whoa. And Holy. it's Just really- now, did that happen? Uh, yeah. it, in the last month. Yeah. Wow. And, and and it's interesting and it and it and one of the things that occurred to me that sort of combines stephanie and chris you know, part of that is a technical solution yeah but maybe part of that is how we use these buildings um uh, what temperatures we're comfortable with what you know does the building take a break or shut down in the coldest time i mean like when we talk about bold ideas i i'm excited about hearing things that are like really change the way we live our lives because I'm not sure net zero by 2050 in an equitable fashion looks like the world we're living in right now. I think it's a, we're living differently. We're making, you know, and for some people, 
I think it's got to get better for some people, as Lydia alluded to before, I think maybe me needs to, maybe I need to dial it down a little. So raise my taxes and do something good with it, please. <laughs> I just have a, a question about when we talk about this goal about the net zero by 2050, am I saying it right? Yep. Um, what does that actually mean? Does that mean every building in the town has to do that individually? Or does that mean you're going to add up all the energy used by the town, including all the rentals and like maybe all the landlords say, no, we're not going to help at all. And so does that mean you're going to do that offsetting thing and try to get a lot of solar panels to make a lot of energy to make up for anyone who doesn't get involved or get their own green thing? So the answer, go ahead, Chris, you want to answer that question? Well, I, I've, I have an answer for that, which is that, I mean, thinking about uh, uh, the, okay, alternate A is to go through, all, go through all the buildings one way or another, I don't have the solution, and make them do a deep energy retrofit of all those buildings and then all th at the sa that same time put enough solar panels on the roof that each building individually is net zero. Uh, that ain't going to happen. But, um, but the, um, there's, it's probably going to be some mixture of things, but uh, we uh, think, think about the electrical group, the electricity group. If it were that the electricity group could, pr could supply renewable energy through the plug every time I plug, in, plug something into the wall and do that town-wide, and grossly increase the capacity of doing that, um, then all you have to do is to electrify all the buildings and, uh, and get rid of fossil fuels. And then you could get all of the buildings to be net zero. And you, I don't think you wanna go that way because that's a huge increase in the amount of electrical capacity. Um, but there's probably some combination of alternate A and alternate B plus some uh, addition, well, uh, there also is the matter of needing to sequester the carbon that's in the atmosphere that you are producing. Um, if there, um, and that has to do with the site group, uh, if it were that we could produce agriculture with um, healthier soils, for instance, and we could grow a whole lot and plant a whole bunch of trees, then we could, that could balance some of the uh, the extra fo the fossil fuels that we do use um, anyway so so there's a, it's not going to be we're not going to go we're probably not going to attack all the buildings and make them net zero but we have to do that with a lot of the buildings perhaps the houses the single family detached houses that's much easier to imagine doing than the large masonry buildings but even you even you can even do that I don't know it's going to be a mixture that's it Chaya. that's the, that's the answer yeah, I think, um, well put, Chris, I think that uh, the, the, uh, by saying uh, the statement net zero by 2050, what that has done is it set the boundary around the whole town. And so it says, well, it's not that each th item within there has to do this thing, it's that the whole town has to do it. And so some things are going to be doable and some things are not going to be doable. So we're going to have to do, you know, uh, we're probably going to have to do all of something. Uh, and to, to get that whole boundary. I might. So it's like the whole math problem of all the different things that go in and out of that. And the circle is around the whole town. Is that right? Right, exactly. That's, I think that's really helpful for people who are here this goal and have like no idea like, how, what? like, how are we saying that's going to happen? Yeah, I think that was really helpful. Thank you. Great, beautiful. I just, I just want to jump in at the to correct everybody because we were talking about net zero by 2050 and the goal is carbon neutrality by 2050 right. and they're different <laughs> so yeah. and it's I know like, it's but just just to be I just want to clarify that point though because net zero is talking specifically about electricity energy use uh, and energy use and carbon neutrality is bigger than just electricity and energy use. Um, yes, so that's, uh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, it's, this is, I'm, I'm going to 
caution us not to jump into the conversation about the difference between energy and carbon and uh, because while it's a simple concept, the functional differences and routes you can take are quite myriad and you can sort of go a zillion ways. Um, but Jesse, you have something you're trying to get across here, I think? I think, quickly, yeah, and I think this is what everyone's been saying, but it, it kind of is everything. Um, it's the, you know, it's the tailpipe of the bus, you know, it's the carbon that's be going into the trees, it's the carbon that's coming out of the buildings, it's, it's the food we eat, you know, this is a, another one that may be <laughs> radical, but if simply the entire town ate local vegetables and stopped eating imported meat, that would probably do half the job. I don't know what the real numbers are, but it, 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 there's, or it's the waste we produce, it's the things we consume. I think it's, and that's where the system boundary, if we draw it too big, it gets very overwhelming very quickly. Um, but I think it's important to, at least on a conceptual real level, acknowledge that it is our entire lives being, being measured here. It's not just the buildings. And we've broken it into these component systems groups, or these component groups to digest, so digestible bits. So the buildings in town is what we're thinking about. Um, and the reason it's a whole group is because it represents like a third of our emissions in the town um, or more. It, it's, a, it's a big wedge of the pie and we can really do something great with it. And it's really doable. Um, and if we try to bite up, if we try to do the whole pie at once, it's not doable. So I think that's, that's my kind of quick yeah. point on that. I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, go ahead, John. Sorry. Um, I've got to unmute. Oh, you're unmuted. You're good. I'm unmuted. Okay. Consistent with what Jesse just said, um, I'm a little worried about having too much of a focus on the year 2050. It's not that I don't think we should have long-term goals, but I am concerned that we ask ourselves or create a process that allows the town to ask, what are the most doable projects in the next five years? You know, I don't wanna go from 2020 to 25 and not do anything because we still got 25 more years till we get to 2050. So I think it's important to talk about uh, or to find really a set of priorities that are likely to get the least po political pushback, they'll have the broadest uh, support, that take the best advantage of whatever available technology there is and say, okay, these are the things that we think the town should focus on in the next five years. And try to get that through than doing something that is as broad as what we need to do to get to 2050. Because between now and 2050, um, I'm not saying priorities will change, but the technology will change. And so there are things that would be very costly to do now that may be not so costly to do in 2030. So I think we should think about or, or create a process to allow us all to think about what are the things that we can do now? And I'll just want mention one thing specifically because you all know I'm a big advocate for affordable housing. Um, the town, I think, is gonna acquire a piece of property uh, which is or has been the Hickory Ridge Golf Course. And there's a strip of land right along West Pomeroy Lane that is buildable. And from my point of view, that should be used either for 100% affordable housing or maybe some kind of mixed development with 50% affordable housing. And when that comes up, at this point in time, well, there are some town councils who say, now nah, we should really sell the property to commercial developers because then we'll get some of the money back that we're paying 
to purchase the Hickory Ridge Golf Course, and we'll get more in regular tax revenue coming into town. Well, that's a decision that could come up in the next year. And that could have an impact in the availability of affordable housing in the town in the next five years, because there's a fair piece of property there. It's not huge, but it's still a very good opportunity. And I think we need broad advocacy in order to get the town council to adopt something like that, as well as other things think people may feel are doable in the next five years that we would really like to see the town move forward on. John, that's a great example. And I just, Chris, before you, uh, uh, you start, uh, I'd just like to say, are there other things that you see that should be on that list of things that should happen in the next five years? Yeah, Chris has got a few. Okay, how about you, John? Uh, well, let Chris go. I respect you. <laughs> I would yeah. like to uh, adapt the goal of taking, say, five prototypes, um, one two-story um, multifamily housing, single-family detached housing, a downtown uh, mixed-use commercial, uh, 19th century, early 20th century mixed-use commercial, um, uh, gosh, I had, I had two others, but let's say there were two Whatever. others, yeah. building prototypes that are common and solve those both on a physical, you know, how do you, how do you make those buildings uh, net zero or carbon neutral? Um, uh, but how do you also solve the, uh, the, the, the organizational, cultural, um, financial uh, s problems, like particularly how do you, what would it take to take a, 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 a colonial village and make it, uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, carbon neutral, but not just physically, I know how to do that. It's uh, how do you, where do you find the money and how do you compensate the uh, owners who have uh, to partly and how do you manage the moving out or the, the, the actually doing the physical renovations in such a way as to not to be too burdensome on the tenants, that kind of thing. Take some prototypes and do five of them in the next five years and those, use those prototypes be, um, have those prototypes be uh, the model for what we do in the remaining 25 years. Hmm. Okay. It's a great thought. Um, other thoughts about yeah, Lydia, go ahead. Um, we, you know, with our utilities, we all pay into the mass save program. And, um, I like, uh, Ludmilla have taken advantage of that in my own home and, uh, been able to make it, you know, a lot more sustainable and, um, a thoughtful place to live. Uh, and it seems like uh, there have been attempts around the valley to get, to go door to door to get people, everybody who's eligible at all for the mass save problem to get an assessment. You can have one every three years. And right now they're paying 100% on insulation till the end of this month. Um, so some kind of campaign to get uh, anybody who's eligible. And I'm not I can't remember exactly. I think if you have more than four units, rental units, you can't do it, but um, mm -hmm. something using that money that we're already spending, all of us. Exactly, that we're already collecting. Yeah, yeah great. Um, so it is 2.55. Um, it is probably time for us to kind of wrap up the conversation. Um, I'd like to really, uh, I just really appreciate uh, the thoughts, the thinking bold, the real, real thought about governance and what does it mean and how do we do that in a way that makes sense to make these decisions that we're trying to make. Uh, those are all really huge, really huge topics. Um, I am sorry that uh, Janine had to leave us uh, during this conversation and that Georgia couldn't make it um, uh, because of work. 
uh, and we appreciate and understand that everybody, uh, you know, things change and it's a chaotic time. Um, but I just would like to appreciate uh, um, those, uh, the folks who wanted to be here and had a hard time making it. Uh, Jim, Millie. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank Go you. Ahead. I just wanted to add two cents on the first five years things mm -hmm. that we could oh, and ought okay. to do perhaps is especially um, if, if you hadn't discussed this earlier, but I think looking at uh, ways to engage neighborhood associations and neighbors in supporting each other around the use of the Mass Safe program especially for landlords of small rental properties, um, because I think some of the things that I heard that really um, shocked me and that I've been sitting with since the last meeting, especially from the point of view of those who rent and live in apartments that have um, issues with pests and really poor exterior envelope, um, one of the benefits of the Mass Save air sealing program is that it plugs up holes that permit mice or insects or other things to breach the, the um, exterior walls. Um, and I found that out of my home and the interior environment of my home got improved tremendously just because of the air sealing. And I know a lot of properties and property owners don't have the finances to invest in improving their home, the homes that they're using as a resource and as an asset to live, who are not very wealthy necessarily, but for whom renting a room or an apartment is really important. And so finding those early sort of, those ways to improve both um, accessibility and quality of um, life and the building stock with the basic uh, improvement strategies that may be a little bit hard cognitively to approach, but once you've done it, it becomes easier to keep doing more. You know, taking the low hanging fruit when it comes to finding people to adopt these initial practices, then also prepares you to handle the more complicated issues that are going to be needed over the next 25 years. So making sure that everyone is doing the basic minimum, I think will help us continue conversations. And I do think it's important to establish on, ongoing person to person campaigns that we can sustain for 30 years in order to get to 2050, because those are the most important things to work on on an ongoing basis. We all have to prepare our minds, our purses, <laughs> our you know ability to tackle this difficult problem together and starting now is really important thanks Lamella. that's uh, beautifully said um uh would anybody else uh have final things to uh to say i'm gonna assign everybody homework you're gonna love it All right. Um, so we haven't scheduled the next meeting. We, as soon as we do, we will let everybody know. We'll go ahead and put it on a calendar for you, Ludmilla. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so homework. It sounds like the homework needs to be uh, to advocate in whatever way works for you with the town manager for uh, providing some funding to uh, get community captains funded uh, to participate in city government. That seems obvious. Uh, so we wanna hear about how you did it. Um, uh, and um, our next, um, so sort of the, the next conversation we're gonna have, uh, was well, we did talk a lot about principles today and values, especially thanks to uh, to Chris and Gizikaya, uh, and Jesse and Sarah for that really great uh, introduction. 
Um, uh, we also talked about actions and there was a lot of discussion of specific actions. At our next meeting, which will be in about a month, uh, we will uh, take the opportunity to think about how we actually achieve those things and what ways are most effective and valuable for us to do that. We've already talked some about that today. So we're, we're teed up well for this conversation. Uh, and um, I sort of never got to this, uh, but you know, what we're up to here, and I've said it before, is that we're up to writing a climate action and adaptation and resilience plan for the town of Amherst. Well, what that means is we're gonna create a document and a series of plans that suggest to the town of Amherst what action steps to take and how to take them to reduce uh, carbon emissions and to prepare for a changed climate and to strengthen the community uh, and communities of the town of Amherst. So how we do those things, what it is that we do, and what standards do we hold ourselves to are all very, very important. Next time we're gonna talk some about how we do these things. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? Uh, Stephanie, you look Jim, like, yeah. can I just amend the homework just a little bit? Oh, in sure. And that I would encourage people to reach out to their elected officials, which mm. are their town councilors. Um, they are really, I think the people, I, you know, I'm not saying don't contact the town manager, but I really think you wanna speak directly with the people that you have elected in office to represent you. <laughs> so uh, I would encourage people um, to do that as well. And I'm happy to help. Um, I'm sure Gazi Kaya is help, happy to help if people need to identify who they are. Um, we can help you in, in that process as well. Great, thank you for that clar clarification, Stephanie. Jesse. Jim, would you say, is it safe to say that our next meeting will be increasingly concrete in the things that we're talking about? Well, that's the, that's the plan. Okay, great. And that, I think, I think people will be ex welcome that. Um, I think that, I, that seems the direction we're going at. Um, and then the other thing is just to offer up either through Gazi Kaya or however it works, if anybody wants to follow up on the presentation Sarah and I gave um, and kind of dig into that language and those terms and feel more ready to speak the, speak that language at our next meeting, I am as available as needed between now and then. I'm happy to like set up a, a just like a little informal discussion on some of the tech and the science of it. Um, so I'll throw that out there. And Great, thank you. Thanks, Jesse. That's very thoughtful of you. We'll also, um, Stephanie, I haven't said this to you, but I'm thinking we might try and extract out your presentation, your and Sarah's presentation, uh, as a sort of standalone item that people can, can check into uh, because it was so lovely. Um, so we'll see if we can, we can do that. Uh, Stephanie, I'm sure we can figure out some way to do that. We can handle it. Uh, if we can get to the, to the uh, recording. Um, anything else? Yeah, Ludmilla. Is there, um, what, did I miss like a position brief that could accompany this um, advocacy on our behalf to our counselors for funding? Uh, yeah, unfortunately there was a little blur. We had a conversation about it. Um, so maybe what we'll do is we'll uh, send a little note out that has sort of what we were talking about with the notes. Um, we can't, as part of this uh, sort of structuring the committee, advocate. Uh, and um, so we have to, uh, ourselves, Lauren, myself, Kazika uh, does plenty of advocacy, uh, um, and Stephanie can't really advocate, uh, and probably the ECAC members, uh, but you can, and um, uh, and so we'll put together some notes about what we talked about. And I would be happy. That would be very helpful. Yeah, and I'm happy to connect um, you with other um, people in the community who could talk about, you know, that the work that's being done around advocating um, for. There's 
many people organizing, as I think someone mentioned before. So um, always looking for more people to get involved. So I'm sure I can make those connections for anyone who's interested. Yeah, fantastic. All right, team. Thanks a ton. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.